So Mark, tell us, how do you curate a city? <laughs> um, curating a city is very similar to curating a museum. Uh, what you do is you take the stories, the stories of place, and you weave them together. You develop context, perhaps uh, local context, such as uh, wa how a building was used, um, who built it, who lived there. Uh, you mix that with historical context, such as uh, the ethnic or immigrant makeup of a neighborhood and how that changed over time. You look at the built landscape itself and find clues that might take you into the past. Uh, so the city becomes a kind of uh, a representation of our collective past. And usually it's not just in a single place but cities will often tell stories that reach well beyond their uh, stories of origin. Um, two really important concepts. One is the novelist Italo Calvino, who's an Italian novelist, argues that you can read the city like the lines of your hand. Um, every lamppost, every railing tells a story, and that's really the inspiration for my work in thinking about curating a city. The second thing is the, mo the mobile revolution, the revolution in mobile technologies, now allows us to bring this wealth of information digitally into the city itself. So it reactivates the city as a lived space. And what are the difference in challenges between curating somewhere, um, say like uh, as old as Florence, with somewhere where you come from, like Arizona in America? <laughs> well, the, uh, let's take Venice, which I, uh, since I mentioned Calvino, um, you know, you see in, in Venice the physical landscape, or Florence as well, the physical landscape is much older. Um, so it, you can see the kind of age of the city side by side with the newer infrastructure. So in Venice, for instance, there are no cars. So you really get a sense of going back to that place. So if I were curating Venice, I would really use that to my advantage. By contrast, here in Florence, you'll see these old buildings next to, you know, uh, narrow sidewalks filled with motorcycles. That also I would use to my advantage um, as a curator. Arizona is different. It's been it's all built essentially in the 20th century, but there is a, a native cultures that go back thousands of years, and you can uh, find the traces and marks of those cultures. Um, but in terms of thinking about uh, contemporary culture um, in, a, in a place without a particularly beautiful architectural representation such as Arizona. It's really about collecting oral history and other forms of storytelling. Mm. So the truism you were discussing today is that all history is public history. Should all historians be public historians? I think all historians are public historians. I think um, we can't help but engage these conversations about our cultural identity, which is what history gives us. Uh, I think some historians, and I would count myself in those, uh, who are reflexive as public historians are more aware of building the kinds of conversations that will change um, public views of history, that will engage put the public in interpretation. I think uh, quite often in academic settings, uh, historians can be content to just talk to their colleagues. I think that's a mistake. Um, because their work is part of that fabric, whether it should be, you know, whether they want it to be or mm. not. And I think they should engage it and use their work to transform our culture and society. And you talked about students being made to write uh, Wikipedia articles. I suppose that serves a couple of purposes. Does that help to stop the language they use to describe their field becoming sort of ghettoized by the academic climate? Well, I think um, because Wikipedia is so, it does two things. One is, at the most practical level, our students, uh, especially after they've spent some time with us in the classroom, become experts to some degree in their own right. No, surely they're not historians yet, but they're, they know a lot. They, can, they have a lot to say, and they can create, help make this encyclopedia a better encyclopedia. So as a practical matter, it improves the quality of Wikipedia itself. Um, I think it has a second purpose, which is to empower students to be storytellers, to be confident in their voice and to be confident in their skills. Uh, and that it then allows them to, to use this kind of user-generated digital age to their own best advantage. 
And what effects might this new world have on the old, more established, traditional, academic, professional kind of history writing that we're also used to? <laughs> well, I, I think um, uh, three things. Uh, I think it's, challenge, it's, it's fundamentally challenging what we do. That doesn't mean writing or reading or books uh, as such will go away. What it means, though, is that it, how we consume information is changing. And I think to be an effective uh, professor, whether you know, you're a researcher or teacher or public historian, uh, you need to be um, aware of those changes and modify your arguments and present your arguments in these new contexts. So I think it makes us, it'll, it forces us to be more um, thoughtful as practitioners. And I'm sure it encourages more people to um, become interested in history. Uh, if we succeed as public historians, mm. then if, and, and really do it well, then people will get drawn in. And one of the ways we can draw people in, and this is why the Wikipedia entry, and I haven't done this in my classes, but I know um, colleagues at other universities who have, the Wikipedia entry makes them realize that they can be part of that conversation. Um, and that gives them ownership of history and it makes our role um, actually as historians easier because we're working with a more literate and capable public then. Excellent, Mark, thank you for joining us. Uh, great, thank you.